Coming up, a man that shot at Yuma police while fleeing a robbery sentenced in court will tell you how long he'll be behind bars. Also, a shooting locks down the Capitol. We're learning new details tonight about the suspect who was shot by police. Plus, top health officials meet to discuss stopping the Zika virus, but now the mosquito-borne illness is closer to home. We'll tell you what Arizona County has just gotten their first confirmed case. 13 on your side, live at 10 starts right now. Live from across the desert southwest, with your latest local coverage, this is 13 on your side, live at 10. Good evening, thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Cor Snylander. A man who shot at a Yuma police officer is sentenced in Yuma Superior Court. Isaac Lopez will spend the next 20 years in prison. Lopez pled guilty to theft of a means of transportation, burglary and armed robbery. Lopez stole a car at gunpoint from the Circle K on Avenue B and 24th Street back on November 18th, 2015. He then shot at police while fleeing in that stolen car. The U.S. Capitol complex was briefly put on lockdown just after 2.30 this afternoon after a man allegedly pulled out a weapon at a visitor's area. CBS's Craig Boswell has the latest tonight from Washington. In. It's okay, it's okay. Just stay down. This video captures chaotic moments after a man drew a gun at the security screening area inside the U.S. Capitol visitor complex Monday afternoon. Where are we going? Where are we going? It just happened so fast. You, you were just kind of like, what? I grabbed my kid, put him under me. Capitol Police say 66-year-old Larry Dawson of Tennessee pointed a weapon at officers who shot and injured him. Dawson was arrested last was fall before. after he disrupted the House chamber <laughs> and had been ordered to stay away from Capitol grounds. There is no reason to believe that this is anything more than a criminal act. Capitol security rushed some people into an auditorium. All of a sudden, it was just a, a scramble with people yelling and screaming and officers just coming out from every direction with guns drawn. Congress is on a break this week. So many lawmakers are back in their districts, but Washington is filled with tourists here while kids are off from school. Diane Bilo's husband and her two sons were inside the Capitol. Just don't expect something like this to happen when you're with your family on vacation. The visitor complex will reopen Tuesday morning. Craig Boswell, CBS News, Washington. Dawson did require surgery. His condition has not yet been released. Investigators say a woman near the suspect also suffered minor injuries. Dozens killed in Pakistan during a tragic Easter weekend as a bomb sent people scrambling in chaos, now leaving many families grieving tonight. CBS's Elizabeth Palmer breaks down this gruesome turn of events. In the coffin, 16-year-old Sharon Petra, just one of the victims of yesterday's attack, targeted on Easter Sunday because of her family's Christian faith. But in crowded public parks like the one in Lahore, bombs don't discriminate. Most of the parents left desperately looking for their children in the chaos were Muslims. Afzal was on the scene. The kids, he said, were on fairground rides when the bomb went off. I carried 20 to be taken to the hospital. They were loaded onto ambulances and rushed away. The anxious parents of survivors hovered at their bedsides, while the devastated families of the dead gave in to shock and heartbreak. Assalamu alaikum. This evening, Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif went on television, promising the nation that he would do whatever it takes to uproot terrorism. Easier said than done, though. On the weekend, Sharif had to order police to disperse Islamic hardliners demonstrating in front of the parliament, and his security forces faced a bewildering array of extremist groups. In an open taunt to the government and to those who support Pakistan's three million Christians, the Taliban faction that carried out the Lahore bombing has warned it won't be the last. Pakistan's government today ordered a crackdown on extremists by police and also thousands of paramilitaries. But as history shows us, it doesn't take much of a gap in law enforcement for a suicide bomber to slip through. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, London. Following that terrible attack, Pakistan's former interior minister called on the international community to fight terror as a whole, not just ISIS. We are not isolated from the world. What happened in Brussels 
and what happened in in France and you know in Pakistan having 72 percent dead and most of them are children and having done on the Easter day it's not a first attack by the terrorist uh, Taliban or whoever uh, the name you can give they did the same thing in Peshawar in a church so what I mean to say the world must come with a common strategy to fight against the common enemy Belgian police are continuing the search tonight for a man they believe to be involved with last week's terror attack at a Brussels airport. CBS's Deborah Pata breaks down what investigators know so far tonight. Belgian police today released a new airport surveillance tape just before the bombing, but had to admit they are no closer to putting a name to the face of this person, a dangerous fugitive known only as the man in the hat. Freelance journalist Faisal Chefu had been picked up by police last Thursday and charged with terrorism and murder. But he was mistakenly identified as being the suspected third airport bomber by the taxi driver who drove the attackers there. Police released Chefu today due to a lack of evidence against him. Well-known talk show host Vince Kante used to work with Chefu at a local radio station. Before Chefu's release, he told us it was obvious that the man in the video was taller and larger than him. I knew that it was a long time I didn't see him, but I was like, what the, what the, <laughs> it's not possible. But the constant police bungling is no laughing matter. Despite frequent raids, investigators appear no closer to finding the mysterious man in the hat. The superintendent of the apartment that was apparently the attacker's bomb-making factory was too scared to go on camera but talked to us in the doorway. He told us that there were five men who came and went regularly from the apartment, that they were in a hurry to rent it, paid cash up front and used a fake identity, Mikhail Dos Santos. He became suspicious that something strange was going on when chemicals leaked through the ceiling into the apartment below theirs. The superintendent also smelled a noxious odor coming from their rooms. The superintendent did not report this to police because he couldn't be sure that something criminal was going on. It was only when investigators raided the place immediately after the bombings that a deadly haul of explosives and chemicals were found. Deborah Padder, CBS News, Brussels. Firearms will not be allowed at this summer's Republican National Convention in Cleveland. That word came down today from the U.S. Secret Service. Ohio is an open carry state. Firearms are not permitted inside the Quicken Loans Arena where the GOP convention will be held in July. A petition to allow open carry firearms was posted online a week ago at change.org by someone whose user profile has since been deleted. The petition had more than 45,000 signatures by mid-afternoon today. The Arizona House of Representatives held a special hearing to talk about problems Arizonans had during last week's presidential preference election. Some, Arizo uh, some Arizonans even go as far as saying it's voter suppression. The Committee of Elections heard testimony today from Helen Purcell, the Maricopa County recorder. The meeting was open to the public. Many voters expressed their concerns about long lines. Also, many registered as independent voters were not able to vote. We asked Democratic Representative Charlene Fernandez how this affects Yuma County register people and the changing of registration that there might have been people that were eligible to vote but um, turned up as an independent so when they went to their polling place they were told that they couldn't vote because they were an independent um, if that's so if that's so then definitely it would affect all the other counties which would include Yuma County Fernandez also says that a recent bill was passed making the state no longer responsible for funding the polls, which could potentially mean more problems for future elections in Yuma County. Critics say this year's presidential election has been marked by harsh, acidic rhetoric from several candidates, particularly on the Republican side. And the State Department says many world leaders are troubled by what's being said on the GOP campaign trail. Virtually every foreign leader that the secretary meets with expresses concerns about the campaign rhetoric here in the United States and expresses a fair bit of angst about where things are going uh, because these, these, these comments don't, don't necessarily, uh, in many cases, reflect uh, certainly the secretary's view of our foreign policy objectives or in many cases, our own values as Americans. So they have, virtually all of them, have 
expressed that concern, and he said so. And as for exactly what they said and what particular comment uh, uh, they were referring to, I'd let them speak to that. State Department spokesman John Kirby said so far the rhetoric has yet to affect U.S. relations with other countries. Kirby's comments came one day after Secretary of State John Kerry told CBS's Face the Nation that the current GOP rhetoric is embarrassing to the U.S. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump has angered critics with his call to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexican border, as well as proposing to temporarily ban Muslim travelers to the U.S. Senator and GOP rival Ted Cruz has angered some for suggesting that police and other law Law enforcement patrol Muslim neighborhoods. Live from across the desert southwest, this is 13 on your side. Chief Meteorologist Nick Maruzek, we are looking at right now a lot of dust across the area and up until 10 o'clock we were under a wind advisory in the Imperial Valley as well as for Riverside and La Paz County. It's not so much for outside our studio, although it was plenty windy. In fact, we actually saw a 50 mile per hour gust at the Naval Air Facility in El Centro. So plenty of windy weather today and it does look like tomorrow we will see some more windy weather. We'll talk about tomorrow, plus the rest of your seven day forecast coming up in a few minutes. Let's send it back to course. Thanks, Nick. Top health officials gathered near Washington for a national Zika summit today. The mosquito borne virus has spread rapidly through Central and South America and is now being found here in the U.S. And pregnant women are at the highest risk. CBS's Mark Albert reports tonight on the efforts to develop a vaccine and slow its advance. Zika virus is a public health threat that has devastating effects on the infants born to Zika-infected mothers. The nation's top government and private health experts warned Monday of the dire effects of the Zika virus and its rapid spread. Well, it's certainly not slowing down. But despite that, Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institutes of Health told us Congress has still not approved an emergency request for nearly $2 billion to fight Zika. I'm taking money from other areas that we fund in order to fund the very important Zika research, particularly the Zika vaccine research. So other research is suffering? No doubt. There are more than 500 cases of Zika in U.S. states and territories, including 54 in pregnant women. Scientists say there is growing evidence Zika is linked to microcephaly and neurological problems. Some scientists have accused the FDA of hindering patient access to cutting-edge Zika tests developed at hospitals. But here at the summit, the FDA rejected the criticism. It is essential that these tests provide accurate results and why FDA is working with developers to ensure that their tests are properly validated. The National Institutes of Health is working on half a dozen potential vaccines, with the first starting a phase one trial in September. Mark Albert, CBS News, Bethesda, Maryland. Even if the first vaccine trial is successful, though, the vaccine likely wouldn't be approved before 2018. In the U.S., more than half the Zika cases are in Puerto Rico, and health officials say it is a substantial problem over there. The CDC recommends pregnant women or women seeking to become pregnant not to go to Zika-affected counties. And the Zika virus has now arrived in Maricopa County. Today, the county's Department of Public Health has confirmed the first case of the virus in the area, as well as the state of Arizona. Officials say an older woman woman who lives in Maricopa County traveled outside of the United States to a Zika affected area before developing symptoms of the illness. Experts urge travelers who go to Zika affected areas to wear insect repellent and take precautions to avoid mosquito bites for at least a week when they return, even if they have no signs of the illness. Is California one step closer to a $15 minimum wage? Well, coming up after the break, we'll tell you about a new deal allegedly struck between California and labor unions. 13 on your side. We'll be right back in just a moment. Live from across the desert southwest, this is 13 on your side. Welcome back. The Coast Guard says it seized more than 12,000 pounds of cocaine from a vessel it stopped earlier this month. Crew members were alerted by Customs and Border Protection about a so-called drug sub about 300 miles southwest of Panama. Drug subs are semi-submersible vessels often used to smuggle drugs. The Coast Guard stopped the craft and arrested four accused drug smugglers. Officials say the drugs were worth more than $203 million. 
The city of Yuma is looking to cut back more than $1 million they spend every year on keeping up with hundreds of acres of retention basins around the city. They're looking to cover some of those, convert some of those rather, into Zeroscape uh, dips in the landscape. They're designed to collect water drained from the streets to prevent flooding and allow residents to go to their destinations without risking the chance of something happening to them or their vehicles. The city's public works department believes 46 of those retention basins can be converted and save them money. And California could become the first state to approve a $15 minimum wage. Uh, CNN's reporting that lawmakers, the governor, and labor unions have struck a deal to raise the statewide minimum wage. According to their source, small increases to the minimum wage would start next year and continue until it reaches $15 per hour by 2022. Those workers would also be granted three paid sick days a year. The governor's office would not confirm the deal. California's residents were set to vote in November on a plan to raise the minimum wage to $15 over the next few years. But if the state legislature enacts a law reflecting the new deal, the unions will apparently pull that ballot measure. Professors from the California State University system are threatening to strike over low pay. Their unions demanding a 5% pay increase. A third party panel recommended the 23 campus system should meet those demands. When factoring in California's high cost of living, CSU professors are getting paid about 17% less than their counterparts around the country. Chancellor Timothy White agrees that faculty should get paid more, but he says it would take an extra $110 million that's just not in the budget. Meanwhile, the threat of a strike is leaving some students anxious. If they're worrying about how they're going to pay the house, how are they going to pay their child care, then they, they aren't really focusing on the students. As our working conditions are student learning conditions. We are too committed to our students to let management to continue to force them to accept second best. We don't want to strike, but we will. The bitter legal battle brewing between Apple and the federal government may be over. The U.S. Justice Department says it unlocked the iPhone belonging to one of the San Bernardino gunmen. It is now asking the court to vacate an order that would have forced the tech giant Apple to help hack the device. CBS's Terry Okita has the details tonight from Los Angeles. The federal government says it didn't need Apple's help to bypass a security function that was keeping it from accessing encrypted information on the iPhone of San Bernardino terror suspect Syed Farouk. The Justice Department issued a statement saying, with the recent assistance of a third party, we are now able to unlock that iPhone without compromising any information on the phone. The Justice Department asked the court to withdraw an order that required Apple to help the FBI hack into Farouk's iPhone. Apple had refused to help, saying it would set a dangerous precedent and threaten the privacy of its iPhone users. CEO Tim Cook took a firm stance at the company's product launch event last week. We have a responsibility to help you protect your data and protect your privacy. The FBI is now reviewing information it found on Farouk's iPhone. Terry Okita, CBS News. The Justice Department did not provide any details about how and which third party helped the FBI unlock Farouk's iPhone. Apple released a statement saying this case raised issues about civil liberties and the company says it will be a part of that ongoing national discussion. Live from across the desert southwest, this is 13 on your side. Welcome back. After feeling stranded without air services, Imperial County has a new airline tonight. The U.S. Department of Transportation chose Mokulele Airlines as the new air service provider for the Imperial Valley. The two-year contract begins May 1st through April 30th, 2018. Some of the county supervisors say, although they recommended a different airline, they're happy that the Department of Transportation made the decision. After hearing a comment from them, they're more than willing to sit down and work with the Board of Supervisors and work with our needs, work with the community needs, and, and be productive. I think we'll be happy with them. Mokalele will stand up to the plate and do a good job for the county residents. So I'm as happy as punch that at least the Department of Transportation made a decision and we're going forward. Mokalele will provide 24 non-stop round trips per week to LAX using a nine-seat aircraft. Supervisors say flights to Phoenix are being discussed as well. 
The Mexican consulate will host an event for dual citizens to get their Mexican voting card. With a large population of Hispanics living in Yuma County, the Mexican consulate will host an event on April 8th where you can file paperwork for a voting card. The event is free. All that you need is a state ID, proof of residency, and birth certificate. Consul Esabio Romero thinks it's important for dual citizens to be involved in the democratic process and to vote. Creo que es muy importante que lo hagan. I think it is very important to be involved in the democratic process. I think it is also important for Mexicans to vote here in the U.S. as well as their native country. The event will take place at the Mexican Consulate in downtown Yuma and will be an ongoing event after April 8th. He brings you the CBS Evening News every night. Well, tonight he's making the news. When we come back, we'll tell you what awards Scott Pelley's receiving that has ties to Arizona. Don't go away, 13 on your side. We'll be back after a quick break. CBS's very own anchor man Scott Pelley will be receiving the 2016 Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism from the Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. The university announced today that Pelley will receive the award during a November 21st luncheon in Phoenix. The newscast for CBS Evening News will be broadcast that day live from the Cronkite School University downtown Phoenix campus. He's a big idol of mine, and I couldn't think of a finer journalist to give that award to. Thanks for watching 13 on Your Side this evening. For all of us here in Poor Snylander, we'll see you back here again tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening.